Hello, everyone. Welcome, friends. My name is Andrew Gould. I'm a lifelong classical pianist, 20-year music industry veteran, advocate, and proud member of the Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance. First, thank you all for joining. I have to be honest, it's nice to get dressed up. The dressed up is a bit of a misnomer as far as outfits are concerned. I'm actually rocking more of like the Corona mullet, business on the top and pandemic on the bottom. Sorry for that. But seriously, for those new, the BJEA is an organization dedicated to bringing Black and Jewish communities closer together. We recognize and make efforts to understand each other's history plight and are committed to standing side by side in solidarity. We're extremely fortunate to be joined today by two titans for what will surely be a most lively and insightful conversation about the indelible influence of Black music, both in the US and around the globe. It is with great pleasure that I first introduce a new friend H. Beecher, H. Beecher Hicks III, CEO and President of the National Museum of African American Music. This impressive businessman's professional experiences include work in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors, where he has built enterprises wearing many hats as a consultant, banker, investor, and operating executive. Henry joined the National Museum of African American Music in 2009 as a board member, and then President and CEO in 2013. In 1998, Henry was appointed by President Clinton to be White House Fellow. He was Senior Advisor to the CEO of the Corporation for National and Community Service and launched the AmeriCorps Promise Fellows, a program on behalf of the President and General Colin Powell. Henry is a son of a preacher, graduate of Morehouse, and later received an MBA in finance from the prestigious UNC Chapel Hill. He is also a loving husband and father to two. Henry, welcome. It's a great honor to have you here. What an incredibly exciting time for you and the NMAAM. And a bit about our other multi-talented panelists, Harvey Mason Jr., interim president and CEO of the Recording Academy. Harvey's an industry leader, passionate advocate, creative savant, and bright entrepreneur. First got to know Harvey about 10 years ago as one half of super writer producer team, The Underdogs, literally one of the most successful writing and producing teams of all time. Some of the artists that Harvey has worked with over the years include greats such as Aretha, Michael, Whitney, Luther, and Mariah, all the way up to today's stars such as Ariana, Bieber, Jennifer Hudson, Beyonce, and John Legend. In 2008, Harvey established Harvey Mason Media, where he continues to produce and write with and for the most impactful artists in the world. Harvey is also one of the top film music supervisors and soundtrack producers, having played critical roles in Straight Outta Compton, Dream Girls, Pitch Perfect 1, 2, and 3, and many, many more. He sits on the board of trustees for his alma mater, the University of Arizona, where as a gifted student athlete, he played in the Final Four. As mentioned, Harv is interim CEO and president of the Recording Academy. And please feel free, everybody, to leave questions in the Q&A section of the chat. We'll try to get to as many of them as possible towards the end of the conversation. To our guests, to Henry and to Harvey, thanks again for all joining. And with that, Harvey, I turn it over to you. Andrew, what's up? Good to be what's here. Up, Henry, good to see you all. Hey, really good to see you. Bro. That was a very, nice very proper and formal approach to today's uh, event. So I guess we're gonna have to maintain this very dignified aura. But you know, I'm probably gonna slip. I'm gonna slip. I'm gonna slip. Let's have some fun. Let's Thanks for having me. So you're turning it over to me, Andrew. So where would we like to go? How can we start today's conversation? Um, you know, I think it would be, I've given sort of a high level introduction of, for both of you, and, and, and I think it might be more beneficial for you to tell us, uh, or it might be a good way to start, you know, by telling us what you want us to know about us and, and, and where you think, you know, your influence and, and observations can, can take this in the best direction. Great. Well, I guess I can start by just telling you a little bit about what I'm working on, what I'm passionate about, and how it relates to, um, you know, the organization, the BJE. And I think, um, you know, coming from a music family my whole life and growing up in the areas that I did and the neighbors that I did, I had a unique experience. You know, I, I lived through music and was fortunate to have music, um, but also overcame a lot of things in my youth that made it difficult to just be a kid in America, which it shouldn't be, right? And, and I think uh, having those experiences and, growing up that way has informed how I've tried to live my life and how I've tried to conduct myself in business and now ultimately as the president and CEO of the Academy. And at the Academy, 
we're very, very focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And this is not a new thing. You know, I was elected as chair uh, 18 months ago, and my platform in running for chair of the board was uh, we needed to improve, we needed to change, we needed to evolve and transform the academy. We needed to be more in step with what was happening in society and in the culture and in the music community and make sure we were relevant and making sure we were up to date and up to par with um, things that were happening in the music industry, but also things that were happening in society. So I was elected as chair, uh, then was named president and CEO uh, as we had a, a, a departure from our last CEO. And I've been serving in that role for a year. And in my time, we have completely transformed so much about the academy, so much about our, our policies and processes. Uh, we've affected the membership, membership. We've changed how we uh, invite new members and diversified our membership and our voting body. We have gone into our leadership and elected leadership and staff leadership and really changed policies around some of that. Uh, we've instituted new partnerships, so we can talk more about it in the future, but all that to say, I am very passionate about solving issues very, very concerned about improving um, fair representation around the academy and in the industry and in our society at large. So very happy to have this conversation where we can start talking about some of the things we all can do together uh, through music and otherwise to, to improve things. Turn it over to, to you, Henry, at, at that point, if you want to give a little, yeah. little setup. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I appreciate that. I think it's it's good to see you again, Harvey, and thanks, Andy, for having us. And, you know, I, I think that our museum, the National Museum of African American Music, uh, which just opened, I guess it's been about two months ago or so now here in Nashville. I mean, I, I really look at our work as a diversity and inclusion initiative uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. You know, we really are telling a unique story, a story I like to say has never been told before until now. Uh, we really have put the story of American music into historical context. So uh, we start in the 1600s when Africans were brought to these shores and we go all the way up through the present day. But the thing that I like about it is not only does it center African Americans in telling the story, but it also is welcoming of everyone. So it is a place of joy and celebration and overcoming. And it really highlights uh, the influences that so many people of all different walks of life and cultures uh, have have come together to create what we now call and regard as American music. And so we really kind of tell this story in a very inclusive way. And, and we really hope that everyone can leave, uh, you know, having learned a little bit about uh, religious music or jazz or the blues or rhythm and blues and, and, and even hip hop. And, and interact with the technology and that sort of thing, but really come away uh, feeling like they came to learn more about our American culture uh, and learn more about how we can, can share and celebrate our common humanity. Amazing. I cannot wait to get down there and see it. So how did it come that you set this up in Nashville and were there decisions around why that would be the perfect place or how did that happen? Yeah, you know, I mean, it really is a pretty interesting uh, thing in that the original plan was for the museum to be kind of a black history and black culture museum uh, and not necessarily to focus on music, but uh, as Nashville was growing and becoming more and more of a music center and really adopting and, and sort of embracing more fully this music city identity, uh, it really became clear that the way to tell this story was through music and that it really should have more of a national platform than just a local platform. And, uh, and so it really kind of was just an evolution. It was not a specific decision, but I certainly think it makes sense. I mean, it's in the center of the country. Uh, it's easy for folks to get here to Nashville, even in a pandemic. Uh, lots of folks from LA uh, come and hang out in Nashville and lots of folks from New York come and hang out in Nashville from time to time. So it's kind of an easy spot uh, that where uh, nobody feels like they're being shortchanged. So, so it's kind of a kind of a cool thing. That's amazing. how about you? Tell me, tell me what you know the 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 latest. I know you you got a show you're planning for coming up here. And it's a little one, yeah, just a little one. Yeah, yeah, just a little one. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's been pretty hectic. And how that's different this year. 
yeah, it's definitely been challenging with COVID and all the different um, safety precautions and systems that are in place for being able to bring any people together, let alone an audience. So yeah. this year we won't really have an audience. It'll be very limited number of spectators. There will be live performances, which I'm very excited about. You know, we've seen so many of these like Zoom shows where people are tuning in or sending performances in from their living room or for their garden. Uh, we're not doing that, thankfully. We're bringing people onto the Grammy stage with real performances uh, here in LA. Uh, so excited about that. We'll also have live awards. I'm sure there'll be some people on Zoom, but for the most part, we're trying to encourage people to come uh, to the venue and, and do what we think would be a cool live presentation of the awards. Again, the, the audience is disappointing. We can't have our you know, screaming fans there and, and have that energy in the building that we'd like to have, but I'm just thankful that we're able to do the show. You know, we postponed, we were supposed to happen Jan, January 31st and yeah. just was not safe, didn't feel like the right time in Los Angeles specifically. So we pushed for a little bit and I think it was the right thing to do because it was obviously for the safety reasons, but also just because the energy and the, the spirit around where we are as it relates to COVID is different. You know, I think we're in a place now where we can start seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. We can start uh, envisioning ourselves getting back to normal. So I think, and I hope that the Grammy show is really a kickoff of that and time to uh, have some, some hope and aspire to be coming together and start doing some healing. You know, we've been through a tough time in our country. And you know that as well as I do on so many different levels, not just COVID related. So uh, a bit of a rebirth and a bit of a celebration, even though it's a tempered celebration. We know there's still a lot of hardship going on, but a time to come together and start feeling good around music. So very excited to, to have it. It's probably the same for you at the museum, right? Starting to see some people come in. I know you recently opened in January. So how has the, the traffic been there? Yeah, it's been, it's been really good. Uh, in fact, I mean, we've been really surprised. I mean, we've adjusted our attendance uh, to, to match COVID and make sure that we can provide for social distancing and that sort of thing. But we've been really surprised. We've been sold out just about every day that we've been open. Uh, in fact, we're, and we, we, last weekend, I think we saw visitors from 21 states, which is really a big surprise given mm. that uh, most of us are, are, are staying pretty close to home. Uh, so it's really cool. Actually, this month, starting this week, we're going to actually add We'd only been open on the weekend, so we're going to start adding in Thursday and Friday to see how that goes. Uh, so, you know, we're still still sticking our toe in the water to try to try to get figured out. But it's been really cool to see people come out, you know, with their masks on and that sort of thing. But really excited to take in the music and, and sort of, you know, get a little bit of a history lesson, but kind of hang out with their friends and family and maybe see a few people that they hadn't seen in a while. And, and so... It really is a cool, cool thing to see people coming back together. So I think the show, you know, doing some of the same thing is probably, you know, really the, the right direction. And I, I certainly look forward to and hope to work with you to see if we can't bring the show to Nashville sometime in the next few years. Well, that'd be fun. I mean, it's a great music city. And now that the National Museum is there uh, of African-American music, it, it would make sense. You know, we're yeah. really doing a lot of outreach into the black music community, talking to the creators and talking to that, that, that group of people to ensure that we are being as representative and reflective as possible. And you know these stats, Henry, like I do right now, and you can correct me, make sure I'm being accurate here. We have found black music uh, makes up 33, roughly 34% of all music being consumed and created right now in the industry. So. You have to remember those percentages when you are thinking about things like, uh, you know, voting or a telecast or membership and keep those numbers in mind as you continue to evolve for us, the academy and also just the industry at large. So uh, yeah. something that we pay close attention to. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, that, those those are about the numbers that we're hanging on to. And good. I'm uh, glad we got it right. Yeah. <laughs> and we're actually uh, looking at uh, doing a state of black music summit uh, here uh, in at the museum in June, which is Black Music Month, mm -hmm. and really having that be something that we do on an annual basis to remind uh, the country about the economic impact of of Black music, uh, and that it you know it's it's a bigger thing I think than people sometimes realize. Uh, so we hope to do some things to really try to uh, bring that to the fore in such a way that folks can have a conversation, uh, hear the numbers, hear the statistics. And, and then sort of take that back into their businesses, into their record labels and, and that sort of thing to, to be able to really act upon that and make better business decisions 
Um, you know, I always say, you know, diversity is really green. Uh, so, you know, it's just a, a matter of making the right, making the right business decisions. And, and so uh, it's, that's really important. But tell me, though, I'm curious, I mean, how have you, how have you sort of taken those statistics in mind and, and sort of how have you begun to impact your voting and your the way the academy operates and even the production of the show how how have you been thinking about that as you as you go forward well with the understanding of the the importance and the relevance of black music it's really affected everything that i've done as chair and then ceo and the decisions that i'm making my first act not my first act but one of the first acts when I was appointed chair was to hire a chief diversity equity inclusion officer, which we've never had in 63 year history of our organization. So there was that, I think that was really meaningful and important. Uh, I think, um, sorry, technical, technical snafu. Doing that, uh, a partnership we established with the Color of Change, which is the largest online uh, racial justice organization in the world and establishing that partnership and building uh, a roadmap for our industry together was all driven by the understanding that black music was so important and so so relevant um, and then we also stood up an organization within the academy called the black music collective which we've never had you know we've had a producers and engineers wing had some other like little carve out sections of the academy but now we have the black music collective which is uh, a nationwide organization affiliated by our chapter. So we have 12 chapters and each chapter there's now representatives from the Black Music Collective. And these are people that are in that community that are living, breathing, creating Black music every day. And we specifically did that so that we could continue to shine a light on Black music, but also so we could learn and listen as an academy. I grew up making Black music. I've grown up in the studio my whole life and this has been my career, but as an academy, we thought we needed to have more interactive conversations and two-way dialogue hearing from them what is it that the academy can be doing better around black music and black music creators and uh, what are the things that we are doing right and what are the things we're doing wrong so those are some of the initiatives that i did knowing the importance of black music and knowing uh the percentages and some of the data around how uh, meaningful it was in the industry the other thing is and i heard this the other day and you could probably tell me if i'm right because you know all the history but there hasn't been an American form of music that wasn't influenced by black music. And so I found that to be very interesting. So even when you're talking about other genres that maybe the Academy is giving awards for, those have been touched by black music creators or they have been um, assisted or you know, built on black music at some point. So I think beyond just the 33%, there is a touch point for black music in a lot of other genres. So we have to acknowledge that as an academy and we have to make sure that it's reflective in our membership and our voting and our shows and kind of everything we do. So that's been my, my hope and goal for my time here and for the academy long-term. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, in fact, I like to say uh, when I'm sort of talking often about the museum and how, how and why we would organize a museum and not organize it by genre, uh, not even sort of make it a hall of fame, but really try to deal do really a history museum with a music focus. And so sometimes I'll say, you know, Europeans came to this country and they brought their music and their culture with them. When they arrived, they found Native Americans and Native Americans had their music and their culture. But when Africans were brought to this country, they had their, their culture, they had left so, so much of it behind and their culture was stripped away. Their music, and in fact, their instruments in, in an event called the Stono River Rebellion, uh, the drums were taken away and even banned. Mm. Uh, and so it's really at that moment that I really contend is when American music was born. Uh, because that's when innovation had to occur. That's when something new was created. Uh, was when, when those Africans had to begin to assimilate and adopt and sort of bring, you know, what little they, they were able to bring from Africa and, and then mm -hmm. sort of merge it with what they were hearing and gaining from their European and Native American folks that they were now interacting with, and they created something new. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all of that uh, is runs all the way through uh, our, our culture and through our music. And even in genres of music that are so often considered to be, you know, sort of not black genres of music, there are big, big communities of, of, of black folks and black artists who are fans of that music who are producers of that music, who are creators of that music, um, you know, whether it's country or rock and roll or otherwise, I mean, you know, whatever, even, you know, sort of pop or, you know, grunge or, you know, whatever alternative, whatever you want to call it, 
you know, there are, there are black folks that are participating in that, you know, fully as Americans and fully as innovative creators. Um, and we need to, you know, welcome all of them uh, into being their, their full and their whole selves uh, in a museum, you know, and as well as in, in the academy. So, um, right. so I applaud the efforts that you're taking to, to acknowledge that. Thank you. Thank you. We're doing kind of the same thing in different ways. So yeah. it's always a question that's been posed to me, and I'm always a little uncertain on how to answer, but how would you answer what is or what constitutes African-American music? And I know yeah. you gave a little history there, but where's the delineation? Yeah, I mean, I, I really say, you know, African-American music is American music. I mean, that's kind of the way I, that's the way I answer it. And right. just say, you know, if, if you're listening to it, there's a really good chance it's African-American music. Uh, <laughs> so. wow. That's a great way to think about it. Yeah. So it's just, you know, that, that's kind of the way that I, I look at it. And that's, that's why we tell the story in the museum the way that we do. And, and, you know, what, what I, what we found in just kind of the few weeks or so that we've been open is that what's resonating with people is not not first the music what's resonating with them is actually first the history the history so yeah. so they're they're seeing and they're experiencing their own lives and that's regardless of race and regardless of age and you know that sort of thing regardless of religious persuasion or you know whatever whatever your thing is regardless of that you know you know there's there's 1940 and there's the music that happened in that time and in, in the fifties and the, you know, whatever period of time you can remember back to your grandmother or somebody singing that song, or you can think about your kids and how they enjoy that music. So it begins to resonate with you. And then, and then you go to the artist and then you go to the music and you kind of understand that it all fits and it all fits in all of our lives. Um, and so that's, what's really cool about it. And then all of a sudden you're saying, you know, you know, maybe there's not that big a difference, you know, maybe, maybe we've artificially separated ourselves in some way. Uh, and, and hopefully, again, what our museum can do is just kind of bring us all back together and just say, look, you know, we're just, we're just here, you know, to, to, to use music as a tool and as to have some fun, to heal, to reminisce, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, whatever you're working through, music helps you do it. So. Right. And yeah. I'm also finding Henry that, the black music is doing that not just in our country but around the world right so we're seeing its impact in so many other genres in other countries you know in latin yeah. music i think you're hearing a lot of black music influences sure. um, other countries as well so at the academy that's something we we juggle we are trying to deal with is how do we recognize all those different genres and the amalgamations and the mix-ups and the mashups of Oh, who's doing what where, right? So I'm right. sure that uh, you see that at the museum, but although it's a, an American history museum, but you're seeing the impacts around the world. Yeah, for sure. And we actually close the, the permanent exhibit closes with the international influences. Oh, good, okay. That that. So we actually go all the way, go to uh, Asia and Africa and South America, and we sort of reflect, you know, how, how this music has really kind of gone worldwide and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, so that's kind of the it's very that, cool that story yeah for sure the other thing that i wanted to touch on a little bit if you're in the mood for it is what african-american music and, and black music in general is doing to kind of break down barriers at the academy yeah i personally find that or at least i like to think that music is enjoyed by all different people regardless of your race or gender or religion and if you like the song, you just like the song, right? And you don't really focus too much on the black person created, the white person created it. And so in that sense, I think music can be very powerful, especially in the times we're in now where there's some racially charged energy and things that are happening. Uh, I like to think that we can use the academy and the platform we have and the music that we're attached to, to try and bring people together. And I talked about it on the show, you talked about the museum where people don't care, they just come together. Um, but I think in big picture music, specifically black music, can really be something that breaks down uh, preconceived ideas uh, across racial lines. You know, I think uh, people who love black music start to look at the people who created it slightly differently. But have you experienced some of that or do you, you see that playing out in the museum? Yeah, a, a little bit. I mean, it, in fact, as we did studies in terms of preparing to open the museum, we fully expect that about 80% or more of the folks who visit the museum 
will be non-African American. So mm -hmm. you know, we are expecting that this is a place uh, where certainly African Americans will be welcome, but where you know others, uh, you know Caucasians and, and others will be the majority of those who come in. And you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was I was down the museum on a Saturday, and uh, the the wobble came on over the the overhead stereo system, and ten or fifteen people went out into the middle of the lobby of the museum and started doing the wobble. Oh when I looked around, what I what I realized was that you know it was about a third of them were African American, and the other two thirds were not. Mm -hmm. And yet they were out there in the middle of a pandemic, wobbling, on, and they were dancing together, right? <laughs> yeah. And so we're absolutely breaking down barriers. And, and I, you know, I hope that, you know, again, I think by centering African-Americans and telling this story as the museum does, you know, my hope is that centering is just that. It's centering, but it, it, it envelops and sort of welcomes others in as well and begins to break down those barriers. I mean, that's, that's what we're all about, man. I mean, you know, we, we uh, you know, Martin King said, you know, we can all learn to uh, live together as brothers or we'll perish together as fools. Mm. So, I mean, that's the importance of the museum. That's the, that's the importance of the BJEA. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do, man, you know, break yeah. those barriers down. So. Well, it is crazy because we all rally around music at every part of our lives, whether it's in church, whether it's sporting events, uh, whether it's in the museum, in the lobby. Right. Uh, it just seems like music is something that is above it all and people can can get behind it and it brings you together for sure yeah yeah absolutely well, what's <laughs> what's coming what's coming what 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 else do you see coming for the academy what how does the academy fit in with bjea do you think and and what what do you see coming forward well i think we want to be really good partners uh to the bjea and and just be uh, a resource and a platform an opportunity to have that relationship is meaningful for us and i think the future of the academy whether that's with this organization or just in general, we want to continue to, to evolve. And we, we talk a lot about music and you'll probably relate to this or maybe agree with this, but music has always told what's happening in society. It's also talked about where we want to go. It's been very aspirational. It's always led the way. And so at the Academy, we talk a lot about trying to be leaders and trying to make sure that we are setting an example. So with the BJEA, I think, and my hope is, maybe I'm overly optimistic, is we can together and with the museum be, be leaders in the industry and show the way things can be done when it, when it relates to diversity and equity and inclusion and, and doing things the right way. Uh, so going forward, I would love to think that we could be a part of that and we could be somebody that people look at and say, you know, the Academy, they did it right. They got it right. They, the right people in place, the right systems in place, and they're actually doing the work and they're not just talking about it. So that's my hope. Yeah. Well, you know, and maybe the BJEA can help us both, right? I mean, so, you know, again, want to break down those barriers and really want to uh, be a place where people feel like they can come together and have a conversation, uh, listen, explore, have a good time, listen to some music, uh, learn a little something, dig into the history, but also, you know, grow and, and, and get better and, and become better citizens and, uh, you know, better artists, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So we hope to be a part of that conversation as well. Well, you are big time. And I think to your museum's point, when people learn the history and they learn the history of black music and the interaction and the other, um, the people that appreciate and love black music or have learned or gained something from black music, there's a different level of respect and understanding that goes along with that. You know, if you see, oh, this person like that artist or this group uh, developed their sound based off of these black artists, oh, that's crazy. I love this group, so let me look into this group. So I think the education of the history of black music and um, things that have happened in both of our organizations will be very helpful for going forward in the next few years. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. And and um, what kind of some of the things that we're we're looking at? I mentioned the the summit, but we're also hoping to do a uh, a public opening of the museum, a grand opening for the museum, also in the month of June. Uh, we're this month we're launching in, in Women's History Month. We're launching our Women in Harmony uh, platform, music platform, uh, to begin uh, focusing and highlighting women in music, and so. You know, we really want to be, to your point, kind of that that education hub that that really is a, a tool, a vehicle, a resource 
for the industry and those, everyone who's interested in it to, uh, to kind of jump in and, and learn something new every day and play with us, hang out with us and that kind of thing. So mm, that's great. Yeah. And similarly, we're doing a few events, Grammy week, uh, one women in the mix event, which will really showcase a lot of, uh, different women that are doing great things in, in our industry and in the, our first ever, first ever, believe that Black Music Grammy Week event, which will oh, have wow. performances and fireside chat and some educational in, uh, moments uh, with some moguls of the industry and titans and uh, influential people uh, coming from the Black music community. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm hopeful that we can do some events together with your group and our group. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I'd say sort of, you know, both in Nashville as well as, as uh, you know, potentially out in LA. I mean, one of the things that we recognize and, and want to do is connect with LA and New York a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so physically, our facility is located in Nashville, but no reason that we cannot, uh, you know, be in other places doing other things and, and participating. So, you know, love to work with you all to, to, to help support, you know, black music events at Grammy week and, and some other things as well. Good. Well, let's do it. And I feel the same way about the, uh, the museum that you're doing in Nashville. I think it's an amazing place for, it. I think attracts the right people, the, the right attention. And I look forward to coming down and checking it out myself, but also just kind of figuring out a way that we can partner and the BJEA would be a great, I think, partner as well, because the work that they're doing is really, really important and makes a lot of sense for us all to try. You know, we're, we're all pulling the rope the same direction, I think. Right. <laughs> That's right. For sure. For sure. So, um, you know, um, so I, I was just looking at some questions in the, in the chat. Um, and, uh, somebody commented that, uh, Andra Day just won the golden globe for her portrayal of Billie Holiday. Um, and, and, and of course that, that movie focused an awful lot on the song strange fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wonder, wonder your thoughts on uh, on the impact and significance of that song. And it was it was written by a Jewish poet, and uh, I wish that that particular uh, that I wasn't think, in the movie come out in the movie. Yeah, it, yeah. it would have put a whole different uh, spin on it. Yeah, it's an interesting story around that song, and Andre Day was absolutely amazing in the film. Um, so congratulations to her, big time, and it's really. I think great that they acknowledge that performance. It was a different type of performance. And I think sometimes, um, you know, the Hollywood foreign press would tend to vote for, I guess, but yeah. very excited for her. And I think that song is so meaningful and there's so much history around it and uh, really, really represents something that is important to talk about still. I mean, you play that song right now, it's as meaningful as it was the day it was written and, and originally yeah. produced and performed. So. It has, a, it has a life of its own and it has legs that will continue to go on uh, for a long time into the future. I think besides just being a cool song, right? You're listening to it for the message and everything else, but just to hear the performances are amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really, really was. And, and uh, you know, I thought she did a phenomenal job uh, in the movie and it really, you know, tells, a, unfortunately, a, a very sad story uh, of, of her life, but also a, a really frightening story of our of our American uh, our culture and, and government in terms of how they interacted with her. Yeah. Somebody else asked the question: What's the last album that uh, that you listened to? Last album I listened to last night was Sade, uh "Soldier of Love." Uh, I don't know why yeah. that was all of a sudden something that I wanted to hear as a song that I've or a record that I've loved for a long time. Uh, before that was a Bruce Springsteen record that. I was listening to for some reason. And the other issue for me is Henry, I'm listening to records every day, all day. You know, when I'm not doing my Academy stuff, I'm still producing and doing a lot of music for film and TV. So I do a TV show that has three or four or five songs in it every week. So I'm like constantly listening some, to something for that. Right. And then, uh, I also listen to a lot of Aretha, Aretha Franklin stuff. She's one of my favorites. And in yeah. fact, I'm producing her biopic called Respect, starring Jennifer Hudson, which comes out at some point this year. I, I think we're trying to figure out what's happening with the theaters, but uh, that's an amazing film with incredible music. And I, I'm always a big fan of listening to Aretha recordings. And 
I just like listening to different genres. Every day is a different type of music. Sometimes I'm listening to classical. Sometimes I'm listening to rock. You know, I still love my Def Leppard records and my Police records. And then I'm going to Fleetwood Mac. And then I'm going into Bootsy Collins and Prince and Michael Jackson. So my music tastes are all over the map. It's kind of scary. Yeah, well, can't can't wait for Aretha to come out for the for the Respect movie to come out. And in fact, we're hoping to do a premiere uh, at the at the museum. Yeah, uh, I've, I've heard rumblings about that. That would yeah, be incredible. yeah, yeah. So, so we hope to hope to do that. But that's going to be an amazing, amazing film. I'm I'm sure. And and I know Jennifer Hudson took it out of the park. She nailed it, and she's so amazing. And the the, the her versions of these songs because you know, we, we redid all the music so when you see her singing on screen it's her singing on screen so those versions of the you know you're always worried about they're like oh what are we going to do when it comes to comparing Jennifer to Aretha and obviously there's you know you're not trying to compare but Jennifer really does some amazing versions of these songs and I think people will really really appreciate them yeah that's awesome that's awesome that's really cool Andrew's back yeah what's up buddy you're still muted but you're back You know, uh, I thought I'd jump back on and maybe ask a few questions, a few more questions, you know, before yeah. we uh, say thank everybody for attending. Um, I'm just flipping through here. Somebody, Miss um, Nancy Karp asked about if we could talk about the Black Jewish connection in music and maybe some of our shared histories together. And I, I love that topic. Um, is that something either one of you? I mean, we started on obviously Strange Fruit and how a Jewish writer wrote that. Um, but gentlemen, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll kind of, you know, give it a, a start. I mean, you know, certainly, I mean, I think sort of certainly the, the early days of the emergence of, of American popular music, you know, probably in the 40s and the 50s as, as uh, the Great Migration was underway and, and communities were coming together, um, you know, really that relationship was, was phenomenal. And I think it was, uh, you know, often, you know, a lot of the Jewish community kind of recognizing that shared uh, uh, history that that we have, and and so in <clears throat> in fact, you know, folks like um, uh, uh, John Hammond and and uh, and Benny Goodman and others really kind of bringing to the fore some some great African American talent, and really uh, really even being a big part of uh, bringing uh, folks like Clarence Avon into the music industry and and others on on the business side. So really a a, a a long and, and sort of in the earliest days, healthy, uh, mutually productive relationship. You know, I think there, there began to be some fraying kind of in the, in the eighties or so when hip hop began to take off and, and there were really some, uh, some, some disagreements about the content of some of the music and, and kind of the, the business power versus the creative power and, and how, uh, how that really began to, to, to show some conflicts. Um, and so, you know, that I don't, I'm not sure that since then, uh, the conversation really has been revisited substantially until now. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I think that uh, kind of a, a very, very short uh, summary of that history, but, uh, but that's why I think the BJE is so important at this point. I, mean, I would say like t timing is perfect too, like we see, you know, you know, I, 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 the first Jewish husband and the first um, African American and, and, and non-white uh, female vice president. We saw two new senator, two new senators in Georgia roll in, one black, one Jewish. And, and I think that does, that's not a coincidence. I think that does speak to a, a very shared and, 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 and understood, mutually understood um, history of, of, of each other's difficulties and pain. Yeah. Agreed. Well, yeah, somebody was, uh, well, somebody was telling me uh, or, or suggesting to me earlier this week that uh, that there's a black renaissance going on. And, and I, I think mm. that there's some truth to that. But I also think, uh, Andy, to your point, I mean, there may be just an American renaissance that's going on. And, mm. and uh, you know, maybe we need to think about some of these relationships that we have with one another as a part of that renaissance that, uh, that may be underway. And it's yeah, definitely and I would not even, a coincidence. Uh, sorry, Harvey. No, sorry, Andrew. I was going to say, I would... I like the idea of, of talking about a black renaissance, but I also think the renaissance has been ongoing. I think there's just different visibility mm. around it now and different opportunity around it now. So I think it is a chance for us to uh, showcase some of the things that we've been prolific at for quite some time and it's continuing to open up and 
my hope is that doors will keep opening and we'll be able to to push through them and both from the BJEA side and from the, the, the academy and, and the museum side to expose this black renaissance that is happening and has been happening. Yeah. And I think also a really important reason why we're here having this conversation right now is to also recognize that systematic racism against the black community and anti-Semitism, you know, in, in both domestically and overseas are at all time highs. Like this, you know, timing right now is essential for us to, 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 to really focus on this. Yep. It's not the time for that right now at all. It is the time to get past and get through all that. We need to make corrections, changes have to happen. I don't think anybody has patience for this anymore. You know, I'm, I'm fed up, I'm sure. You know, we're all fed up on the Zoom. It is a time to correct and improve and transform and evolve. And I think we all stand to, to benefit from working together on those efforts. If it's cool, I'd like to pop one more question in here, at least, I mean, there's this one was touched upon earlier, but I think it warrants like a little bit further digging. Why has African American music become the global standard or force for unifying the planet? Well, that's, I mean, very nice to say that it has. I, I think uh, it's been a unifying force because, as I said earlier, Black music talks about real stories and real truths and has real emotion and depth behind it. Uh, and it also is pretending what we hope to see in the future. And so I think there's an aspirational element to it. I also think it's just, it drives culture and it moves culture and uh, music influences fashion and film and um, just behavior in general. So I, I do think that it's a global phenomenon. I think the fact that so many eyes are on our society as a leader in, in art and black music, I think that, um, it has wide reaching implications in so many different areas of, of society. And a lot of it does stem from, from black music. So I'm glad some people think that. <laughs> um, and a couple more questions. Henry, uh, when did America develop its own musical sound distinct from Britain? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I really think that that happened when Africans uh, uh, were brought to this country and had their mm. culture and their music and even their instruments stripped away. Mm. Uh, you really had to innovate at that moment. You, I mean, you had, how, how do you then express yourself? How do you then begin to say, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt here. I'm, I'm not happy here. I'm, I'm, I'm having to figure out how do I sing? How do you sing a song in a strange land uh, is, a, is, a, is a quote that I've heard before. And so I think it was at that moment that that sound began to develop. And so, you know, the first music uh, then would have been kind of the slave songs or field hollers or, or, or spirituals. And then out of that, as the great migration began to, to, to commence, you had the emergence of the blues. You could be a little bit more aspirational in terms of what you were singing about. You could be a little bit more materialistic, a little bit more secular in what you were singing about. And then out of that emerges gospel music. So you kind of put the blues together uh, with the spirituals and, and they have a baby and you got gospel music and then you mm. keep going forward and you, and you create jazz. And so with kind of at the, as the great migration, uh, was, uh, peaking, uh, you had folks all over the country. And so you know, we like to say, you know, here in Tennessee that as African Americans went North from Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana and Arkansas, they moved North. Often they times they went through Tennessee and they dropped breadcrumbs as they went. So you had the blues in the western part of the state that went further north into Chicago and Detroit and west out to LA. You had coming up the eastern coast out of Georgia and Florida. Uh, you had kind of uh, the spirituals going up into the hills of Appalachia and, mm -hmm. and mixing with the Irish Scottish music and creating country music and, and, uh, and bluegrass music. And up the center of the of the of the state, uh, you had uh, the, the mixing in Tennessee and creating the uh, uh, R&B and gospel and religious forms of music before heading further north as well. And so, really, I think that as the Great Migration forced or, or allowed African Americans to leave the Deep South and go out across the country, they were sharing this new forms of music and dropping those that culture as they went. And that's when American music really began to develop its own sound. Mm. Wonderful. Uh, a question for Miss Lisa Robinson. 
She would love to hear each of your thoughts about the music industry's response to ensuring equity in the workplace. What more can the powers that be do at these organizations, as Henry has said, to, to usher common humanity there as well? Well, I think there have been some steps taken so far that seem positive and feel positive. Uh, all the labels are now, and you know, different streamers and publishing companies are now starting to bring in people to evaluate what our, what their diversity policies are. You know, we've seen a huge influx in, in officers at the executive C-suite level coming into these corporations that are now giving input and having a hand in making sure that they're doing things the right way. Uh, my chief diversity inclusion officer has a bi-monthly call with these people and they start talking about best practices and how can we push the, the envelope further? How can we move the needle? How can we continue to improve? So I think there have been some early steps, some early programs that seem very positive and productive. I think continuing to get more black people in the executive roles, I think would be meaningful. I think it would have a, an impact on, on how the business goes in general because the decision making needs to be more balanced and more reflective of people that are actually doing the creating as well. So if there was something that I saw going forward, that would be something that I think could still continue to improve would be making sure that we're educating uh, young black people that there are other professions in the industry that they can be involved in besides just being on the artist side or the, the writing and producing side. And then making sure that as these big corporations continue to uh, look to try and change that they are doing um, fair and inclusive and equitable outcomes for their hiring practices. And I think there's a lot of room there for, uh, for growth. Excellent. Yeah, I um, think Henry, I think, from your yeah, perspective, please. Yeah, I would add that, you know, I, I certainly agree with that. I would add that, you know, once you've got those executives in the C-suite, then you need to put some uh, uh, people of color on, on the boards of directors of these companies. Uh, that's really where the policy is made. And then in addition to that, I think you have to, uh, you can expect what you inspect. And so, you know, how is compensation uh, done in these organizations? What is, uh, what is compensated? What is the definition of success? What is the definition of hitting your goals? And so if, the, if diversity in your, uh, in your boardroom or diversity in your, in your C-suite or your executive suites is, is something that you're being compensated for, then that's what will happen. Mm. Excellent. Um, I think that's kind of it. I mean, I, I, there, there was one question that I want to acknowledge, which was asking for uh, a place, a centralized place for resources, which is a great question. Um, I don't have that handy, but we're going to follow up and make sure that we get that out. And if, if there's one thing that I took away from this conversation, Henry and Harvey, it was really a need to honor our responsibility to use our collective influence, all of us, all of us on this call, to channel. To, to channel the power of music in order to bridge people together as, as you know, music industry uh, involvees, you know, we, we, we all collectively carry a tremendous amount of influence. And, you know, you know myself personally, I, I, I would signed Andrew Day 10 years ago and, and was able to work on Rise Up with her. And, and I don't say that as a pat on my back, rather I say that as it's really opened up my eyes and shown me like what the power of music can can do, what it can accomplish, and how it really does bring bring hope to people and bring people together. So Henry and Harvey, if you have any final words, but I wanted to thank you both for being here. And to everyone watching, please make sure to stay in touch by visiting the Alliance website, blackjewishentalliance.com, and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the Black Jewish Entertainment Alliance. It's great to be here. A very, very important subject and something so worth all of us uh, working towards together. So thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Appreciate being on. Nice to meet you, gentlemen. Take care. Thank yeah. you, everybody.